for the sports day, which is going to be knee and shoulder. Uh, my take today is going to be to speak to you on anatomy and biomechanics of meniscus. <clears throat> and I think it's very important. We know uh, historically that the meniscus existed uh, millions of years ago. It changed in size and shape. And to a certain extent, you know, uh, uh, not very long ago, it was thought to be a vestigial organ. And it was Smiley who promoted, take it out, take it all out. Even if it is not torn, just take it out. So I think that has completely changed. And also Bland Sutton, who said that it's a functionless remnant of leg muscles. All this has been proved wrong, and we know that the meniscus is an integral part of the knee joint, and uh, it's very critical in maintaining the uh, stability as well as uh, the congruity of the joint. And I think this talk has importance because definitely we all need to understand the biomechanics, the anatomy, so as to manage the injuries well. Knee injuries are the most common sports injuries uh, which we see in our practice, but in India we also see non-sporting uh, injuries who come with meniscal tears and internal derangement of the knee. The medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus have typical shapes. The medial is the crescent-shaped and uh, the lateral is the C-shaped. The medial meniscus is less mobile and therefore we see more tears in the medial meniscus as compared to the lateral meniscus which has the popliteus hiatus and is more mobile uh, as compared to uh, the medial and therefore it is less torn. Also, there are meniscal ligaments which give stability and which join the meniscus, the anterior intermeniscal ligament, which is important, the meniscofemoral ligaments, and also the deep medial collateral ligament attaches to the medial meniscus, which uh, again gives it congruity. Then, in addition, there are these coronary ligaments and the meniscofemoral ligaments, which give the stability to uh, the meniscus and attach it. Two more important ligaments, which are the meniscofemoral ligaments, which are just uh, behind the PCL, they are the Humphreys ligament, the anterior meniscofemoral ligament, and the posterior meniscofemoral ligament, also called the Risberg ligament. These are the secondary restraints to the posterior drawer, and one has to uh, uh, keep them in mind, and especially when you're uh, doing these PCL uh, reconstructions. The most important uh, uh, part of the anatomy is the blood supply of the meniscus, which is very peculiar, and this has definitely an impact on the management. We all know that the peripheral part of the meniscus, nearly about 25 to 30 percent, is vascular, and the remaining part, the middle third, and especially the inner part, the white white zone, is avascular. And this is one of the classifications which I find very useful, rather than going to different types of classification. The majority of the blood supply comes from the inferior medial and the lateral geniculate arteries, and they form a perimeniscal plexus, uh, which penetrates the radial vessels, and also the nerve supply follows the blood supply. It is very important for us to uh, maintain this blood supply, stimulate this blood supply when we are doing meniscal repairs so as to ensure proper healing of the meniscus and therefore to preserve the blood supply and to stimulate the blood supply of the meniscus is something important while considering its repair. And this slide just goes on to show that the inner part, which is the avascular part, if the tears are in this zone only, then they should not be repaired. But nowadays, if the tears are going all the way to the red-red zone, even though majority of the tears might be in the white zone, uh, we have now a very low threshold to repair them, and we would first go and repair them, and then we will see uh, what it is. Typically, the longitudinal tears are located in the red zone, the red-white zone, and are best repaired. If you come to the basic sciences, the human, uh, the menisci content is of the 70% water, 22% collagen, and the remaining is uh, glycosamine, fibrochondrites, and uh, other such things. Uh, it is 90% type 1 collagen, and the important thing is the circumferentially arranged fibrils with the radial thyroid, and these are the important ones for uh, the hoop stresses and the shear forces, especially during the deep flexion and uh, weight bearing. I think these circumferential uh, arranged fibers which are crisscross radial and uh, uh, also lie in different angles give the strength and the uh, agility to the meniscus and therefore even in uh, high amounts of shocks up to 300 mega um, MPA, the millipascal, it bears the brunt and get, doesn't get torn. So this is something which is uh, very critical. As the forces go up more than 300, then these are the uh, points when the meniscal will start getting torn. And uh, that is what is important, the amount of force and the mechanism. The important functions uh, of the meniscus are uh, listed here, the important being the load spreaders, 
uh, what the uh, meniscus does is increases the contact surface area and reduces the contact stresses and uh, the lateral uh, tibial contact being concave and the medial being uh, convex, it definitely helps in the congruity and helps also in the shock absorbers. This is something uh, which is an important function and once the meniscus is removed, it shows that the contact surface increases and uh, uh, thereby makes the joint more prone for uh, osteoarthritis. The meniscal also gives stability. Of course, we know that the primary stability does come from the anterior cruciate, the posterior cruciate, and the collaterals. But I think the medial meniscus, the posterior horn, stabilizes the anterior drawer in anterior cruciate deficient knee. And also the uh, meniscofemoral ligaments are secondary restraints to the posterior drawer. And, and that, that is something which is very critical. The posterior transmission of the lateral meniscus is greater than that of the medial one. And therefore, uh, also the tears are much less. Both the medial and lateral meniscus translate posteriorly on the tibial plateau during deep knee flexion. And this is one of the reasons why, again, when you've done repairs, you should avoid deep flexion or flexion beyond 90 uh, in the first three to six weeks. Uh, the meniscal motion through knee flexion, the meniscal translate outwards and also posteriorly. As I just said, the medial tibial plateau is uh, concave and the lateral tibial plateau is convex, uh, increasing the congruity. The menisci also help in nutrition because they help to, uh, for the lub uh, lubrication and spread the synovial fluid, thereby also nourishing the uh, articular cartilage. They have mechanoreceptors which help in uh, the proprioception and the joint sense and again that is something which is uh, very critical. Coming to the tears, if you see the medial tears, the medial meniscus tears are more common and I've already told you the reason as compared to the lateral. What is more critical for us to know as I end my talk is that if the meniscus is removed, we know for sure that the joint is now prone for uh, early arthritic changes. And therefore, we have to always think of preserving the meniscus or saving the meniscus. Whenever we do a meniscectomy, a lateral or a medial, it has been proven beyond doubt, doubt that it will lead to osteoarthritis and thereby uh, uh, make uh, the joint more painful. Actually, these changes were described way back in 1948 by Fairbank, but we never noticed these changes, and it was just in the last two decades that we've been talking more about saving the meniscus. Whenever a meniscus is removed, uh, the joint progresses gradually to arthritis, and we have to understand that this will progress unless you take some precautions. So can the natural history of uh, a meniscectomy uh, once done uh, be changed? It can be, and this does depend on the limb alignment, the associated ligamentous injury, uh, what is the BMI of the patient, what is the activity level, has the patient undergone any knee surgery, and if you can influence any of these in terms of giving the proper alignment, giving the proper stability, then the rate of degeneration after meniscectomy can be slowed. So the way to go forward is save the meniscus, and majority of the tears we know are still cannot be staved, so therefore, Nowadays, we have the meniscal transplants, which are now becoming popular. And if we get time, Anil, we can discuss during the question-answer session. And meniscal transplants in, with the bone plugs are also being done. There are some meniscal substitutes which are gaining popularity, the natural, which are the periosteum or the small intestine mucosa, or the synthetic substitutes, which are being used to uh, preserve the meniscus and help the better biomechanics. So friends, I think it is very important to understand the complex anatomy of the meniscus because it has a direct bearing on the management. And once you understand the biomechanics and the anatomy, I'm sure the way you look at a meniscal tear and its management will definitely change. I thank you for your kindness.